Hello, you're listening to the broadcast from the New Beginning Worship Center in Greenback, Tennessee. We're located on Highway 411, just three buildings from the intersection of Highways 411 and 95. Our email address is simply our initials, followed by the word mailbox at gmail.com, which is nbwcmailbox at gmail.com. We meet Sundays for teaching at 10 a.m., followed by worship services at 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. We also meet midweek at 7 p.m. on Wednesdays. Brother Marcus Severance is a pastor. Now, let's listen in to the message. Good morning, if you can, and stretch your hands this way. And I'm not going to keep you very long this morning. I just want to kind of, something God's laid on my heart, I want to share with you this morning. Amen. Father, God, every day is your day. But especially today, God, because it's been put aside as Father's Day, we honor you in this service. And God, we want to, before we even minister or do anything else, we want to acknowledge that without your breath in our lungs, God, it's the very breath that we breathe that you give us is why we still are alive today. And God, I want to thank you, Lord, for your mercy that you've shown every one of us in our life, the kindness you've shown us, the blessings that you've given us when we didn't even deserve it. But God, most of all, I want to thank you for life and for sending your Son. God, I know one day that I'll go to your throne. I know one day, God... If you'll allow me, I want to be a pillar in the temple of my God. And Lord, I want to acknowledge you in this earth. I want to acknowledge you on this day. That you are the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. God, without you there would be nothing. And God, I'm so glad that you're not a bad father. That you're not an evil father. That you're not a father that doesn't care. But God, you're a good God, a loving God. And most of all, you are the God that has always been and that will always be. You're our Father in heaven. And we acknowledge you today. And we thank you today, God. And the people of God said amen and amen. God said in the book of Matthew in the seventh chapter and in the seventh verse, Matthew 7, 7. I like those numbers. Those are good numbers. He said, ask, and it shall be given you. That's what he said. I like Gilsa, even Gilsa already has confirmed my message. He said, ask, and it shall be given you. Secondly, he said, seek, and you shall find Then he said, Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one he said that asketh receiveth, and he that knocketh, I'm sorry, and he that seeketh findeth, to him that knocketh. I'm so thankful it shall be opened. What man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will you give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more, I love that word, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Will you stretch your hands this way and ask the Lord to bless this word? I want to share a story, if I may, this morning. I've ministered on it years ago, but God laid it on my heart. I want to tell you a story this morning. I'm not going to keep you long. This is what God wanted me to bring. When I was young, when I, I wasn't saved, I was probably nine or ten years old. And I remember one Christmas my dad decided to get me and my older brother. There was only two of us at that time. I think Michael had maybe, I was nine, six years, maybe Michael had been born. He probably had been born. But he wasn't old enough. He got my brother Chuck and me a bicycle. Now I want to tell you that this happened because I can look back on this and I can see what God was was going to do in my life. 
The Lord knew that one day, as He knew about your life, that He would put us in a place where we could minister to people. And this is something that I never forgot. It was something that stuck with me all my life. And so I got the bike on Christmas, but later on in the springtime when it was beautiful outside, late April and early May, you know, and neighborhoods were different back then. People in the neighborhoods, they actually liked each other and got along. Instead of roping their yards off and, and, and you know, and, and putting dogs in their yard to keep everybody out. Neighbors were different back then. Everybody knew everybody. We'd all get together. And we had a bunch of kids in our neighborhood. Everybody bear with me. Had a bunch of kids in our neighborhood, man. And we had a good time together. Man, I love that bicycle better than I love sliced bread. But on this particular day, Joy saying, my bicycle broke. I remember it, it was on the it was on the weekend, like on a Friday, maybe. Or, or on a yeah, it was on a Friday. Uh, if I mean, it was in it was I was out of school, so it was probably late in May, getting towards summertime. But I was calling it springtime, and it broke early in the day. But instead of me taking that bicycle to my dad when I should have, I just continued to play. I played and I played, and there laid my bicycle. My daddy was home all day long. He had been there the whole day. But I was too busy playing. And what happened was, is I probably, Gary, wouldn't even have taken the bicycle to him. But I wanted to ride the bicycle so bad that night because all of my friends, we used to ride, you know, we had them lights, you know, on the thing. And, you know, and, and my dad, as long as I was with people, He'd let me go a pretty good way away from home, only if I was with a bunch of people. But the only reason I took it to him was because day had ended. Night had come. And I thought to myself, you know what? Brother Bill said, I, I, I want my bicycle now. Now I want it. But I just took for granted that my dad would be home. So it's dark outside. I mean, it's dark. You can't see. It's, it's dark. And everybody's getting ready to go ride. So I just assumed that my dad, and what it was, you remember the sprocket on your bike, it was a 10-speed, the sprocket had broke, and, and I couldn't get the chain on. I tried, and I tried to do it myself, but I couldn't do it without my dad. Only my dad was the one who could fix it. I had to take it to him because I couldn't do it myself. This is a true story, church. And I remember wheeling my bicycle. I was, I can see it's a little blue but 10 speed. I remember pushing it through the yard. I can see it right now. And I pushed it right up there on the porch. And I ran right up like I always have all my life for 23 years on 5404 Pinewood Drive in Knoxville, Tennessee, where I was raised. I ran up that little stairs into the house and I started saying, Dad! But he never answered me. I remember I ran in the back bedroom and I looked for him. But he wasn't there. I remember I went in the kitchen. He wasn't there. I ran out in the backyard. I started hollering for him. He wasn't there. He didn't answer. I ran out granny into the garage. Through the, through the other part of the house. Out in the garage. And the garage door was shut. And I was looking for him. But he wasn't there. He was gone. Little did I know that he had left. He didn't tell me he was leaving. I just took for granted, listen to me somebody, I just took for granted that God would be there. This is, the, this is my life. I just took for granted that my father was going to be there. So the first thing that I did is I started throwing a big temper tantrum like we all do. Come on somebody. I started throwing a temper tantrum, man. I started crying. and I mean, man, I, I remember it like it was yesterday. I mean, man, I got mad. I kicked my bike, I, 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 I tried to fix it again, and I started blaming my daddy, but my daddy had been home all day long to fix it. I knew that, I wrote this down, I knew that he could fix the problem. I had all day long, Janice, I had all day long, Brenda, I had all day long, Josh, to take it to him. But I didn't, that was my fault. I didn't know where he was. I didn't know where he had gone, and he didn't have a car phone back then like he did years later. He, he was got the highfalutin. He got one of them car phones. I'd have called him. 
I didn't have anybody to call. And I remember sitting there. I remember I opened up the garage and I sat in the garage and, and, and I turned the garage light off and I could see my, the neighborhood had a lot of lights and I sat there and I cried like a baby and I said, I said where, where did you go? Why aren't you here to fix my bike? I want, I, want to ride, I want it now. I want to ride my bike now. I want to go now. Where are you, Dad? Later on in life, I remember that God began to deal with me when I was young kind of ashamed to talk about this I've never told this from the pulpit I don't think God had really started to deal with me about my life I remember when he began to convict me he began to convict me about the way that I was living and the things that I was doing he simply said that I had not because I asked not I never knocked I never asked I never sought him I just took for granted. Listen, everybody in here, I just took for granted. I was in school when I was 17. This group came to play on the guitar. This guy was an incredible guitarist. He loved God. He's one of the strongest I ever felt God in my whole life, even to this day. Even I've been in services. It was one of the strongest that I've ever felt God ever in my life. It, it was so powerful in that service that morning. It was so incredible. It was in the school service. It was a school service. And this guy was playing Sweet Home Alabama, but he was talking about God, and he started singing about God. And I mean, I've never to this day ever felt the presence of God like I did in that school service that afternoon. But you know, I remember when I walked out of the school service, I mocked God and I laughed. I never. I remember. Oh, I, I remember opening the wooden door and saying something to one of my schoolmates and mocked God and laughed about it and just kind of blew off the conviction. And God would run that through my mind for years and years and years. When I was 20 years old, I was laying in bed one night, and Brother Gilson, I thought for sure I was going to die. I thought this is the night that I'm, go I'm going to die tonight. I, I, I mean, I thought literally that I was going to die. I, don't, I can't tell you, this felt like death but had come into my room to take my life. And I was laying in a bunk bed, and I began to cry out to God. I began to say, God... And I'm not even saved. And I began to reason with God because when I was a little boy, I should have died. I locked, you all may laugh at this, I locked myself in a dishwasher when I was four or five years old. Everybody remember that story? I would locked myself in a dishwasher that my dad had left out on the back porch and I didn't like my next door neighbor, Gillis. She was so nosy, she'd always get me in trouble. I never liked that woman, but thank God that day she was keeping an eye on me because she, she finally called my, my grandmother, who my mom, I don't think she was home. She called my grandmother and said, oh, it's been about 20 minutes later, I'm in this little dishwasher suffocating. And she finally decides, true story, and calls my, my grandmother and says, oh, I didn't want to get him in any trouble because it seems like I'm always calm, but he's, he's locked himself in the dishwasher on the back porch. Thank you very much. But you know what? To this day, to this very day, I thank that lady. Her name was Jackie Kirk. I'll never forget her name. Never forget her. I thank that one. She saved my life. God saved my life. You say, why are you saying that? Because, see, I, I've been out playing all day. And God was trying to say to me, you know, you think you're free, but you're not. You think that you're not ever going to die, but one day you are. If I don't come, you are going to die. And he went on to tell me through this, he said, you know, he said, later on when I did get saved, he said, when you, I want you to minister this, and I want you to tell people that there's a lot of people, that's their mindset. I've got all the time in the world. Daddy's going to be there. I've got time to take it to him. But let me tell you right now, if you've got a problem in your life, you better not wait. Amen. You better come on, somebody. You better take the problem to him now. The problem in our life is what he was trying to show me. The reason that he said that you're going to die it's not because I hate you it's not because that, that you even don't even know me he said the reason you're going to die is because you have sin in your life and unless you bring the problem like the bicycle you can't fix it only I can I've got the remedy praise God he said I'll put your life 
where it needs to be. I'll put the chain, praise God, back on the sprocket again.